Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome to the behind the scenes video here on the second channel. I want to share with you one of my favorite walks near where I live. This is a really cool place. This is a wildlife refuge. These are all bald cypress trees. Now, bald cypress trees are interesting because they usually grow with the root system underwater. You can see the water line up there on that cypress. But right now, we're in the middle of a drought. And there's a lot of attention these days going to drought-resistant crops, drought-resistance, blah, blah, blah. But trees, we don't really think about trees. There's a really cool tree here in the south called the longleaf pine. It used to be everywhere, but now it's not. It does really interesting things to survive during a drought. And today we're gonna learn about that by going to Auburn University and the E.O. Wilson Center for Biophilia, which is something I didn't even know existed until I drove up on it on the road. It was fantastic, I just found it out of nowhere. Anyway, today, the whole point of this video is to tell you about the Silvix of trees, which is what I just learned, but more importantly, to get you excited about donating at teamtrees.org. There's internet content creators from all over the internet. We're working together and we're trying to plant 20 million trees. And the way we're doing that is raising $20 million for the Arbor Day Foundation, who's agreed to plant one tree for every $1 that's raised. That is a tremendous opportunity for us to plant trees together. You can also click the button down below here on the YouTube watch page, there's a donate button that goes straight to the Arbor Day Foundation. So please consider doing that. And without further ado, we will go learn about trees. Okay, to learn more about why certain species of trees grow in certain areas, we're here at Auburn University and we're gonna go visit the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences. We're gonna learn exactly why trees grow in certain locations. Dr. Barlow, that's who we're here to see. Hello. Dr. Barlow? Yes. Hey, I'm Destin Sandlin. Hi, Destin. How's it going? Good. Doing all right? Yeah. Good to see you. Um, so you're a professor of what here? Forestry. Forestry? Mm -hmm. How long have you been doing this? Um, 2007. We also write publications for landowners. About trees? Yeah. About wildlife trees. You have a cool job. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's nice. Oh, look at that. Longleaf pine stand dynamics. This is really cool. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Dr. Kush, Forest and Fire Ecology. Yeah. What a great title, I guess it is. It's amazing. Wildland Fire Club. Dr. Barlow and Dr. Kush. Hello. And you guys are the tree experts in the Southeast, right? No. No? no? <laughs> what do you mean no? <laughs> There's no such thing as a tree expert. You, know, you have a lot of knowledge, but I don't think anybody can really truly call themselves an expert. But, but what do you do here? This is the school of... Forestry and wildlife sciences. Okay, well, I mean, how, if you're not a tree oh, we expert... we study trees. Okay. So we can, for, for the layperson, we might be the experts, but I hate to view myself as an expert of everything because there's always something you can be learning every day. Got it. Yeah, get smarter every day. I see what, you, I see what he did there. I didn't even get paid to say that. You didn't get paid that. to say that? That's good. <laughs> That's good. So I'm noticing right here on your desk, I'm seeing things like redstone arsenal. I'm seeing a lot of files from different places. Right. Are you doing tree studies all over the country? All over the southeast, more so. Really? Not the country. It's okay. expensive to travel. Really? So. So, so my focus has been longleaf pine, so that has limited me to the southeast. That's my love. And fire. What is a longleaf pine? It's the state tree of Alabama. You should have learned that in your education as a child growing up, I assume, in Alabama. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so it is the tree that built the south and probably built this country. We give it no credit. What do you mean? Uh, it was it occupied 90 million acres plus from Virginia to Texas. It was really one of the first exports from this country to go across the seas. And today we just ignore it. Your jam is the longleaf pine. It is. That's your, that's your thing. That's there's, thing. There's a glimmer in your eye when you're oh, yeah. saying <laughs> so, That's what it's all about yeah. in the southeast. Really? Right. Okay, so why is, why is that your thing? Uh, because it's just so uniquely adapted to what conditions were in the southeast. It's telling you what nature had here. And I believe that nature is our best manager, and so we need to have more longleaf pine because it will ultimately provide us with the greatest resources. I see. So this is about using the environmental factors that you have at your disposal in your specific location to have a symbiotic relationship with trees so that we as humans get the most out of the trees and they yes. get the most out of us? Exactly. Okay, got it. So, longleaf pine. Longleaf pine. What do I need to know? Burn it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Burn it. What do you mean? Plant it, burn it. What do you, uh, what do you mean? You got use prescribed fire, get your little area cleaned out, get your trees planted. 
Wait a year, burn it. So you're talking about the, the undergrowth. The undergrowth. Okay, okay, so you're not saying like cut the tree down and burn it. No, don't cut the tree down. Okay. Please don't cut the tree. We're doing too much of that already. Okay, so so fires can be a good thing if they're done correctly is what you're fires saying. Fires are, are an excellent thing if done correctly, but we have to do it correctly. What do you mean? Um, you have to prescribe, get your conditions right, prescribe the fire, get a burn permit from the Forestry Commission, and do what's right for nature. You're just mimicking what nature did. If we weren't here, it would be happening. So this is the, this is the fire torch? So this is a drip torch. Um, and so what we do in this is put in a mixture of gasoline and diesel fuel. Um, the diesel fuel helps to carry the gas. And so you drop it over, put a little bit of fuel on the ground, light that fuel on the ground, put our wick on our torch in it. It will catch fire. And then as you walk, it's dropping out little balls of fire uh, that we'll be putting inside the prescribed area that we want to burn. That's awesome. And so you have a you have a permit and you have people monitoring the fire and all that good stuff when it's going on. You watch intensity and you know see what happens. You might have to add in a little bit more fire, or maybe slow up on how much fire we're putting on the ground depending on how it's burning. So you always need to be aware of how your fire is burning. So let me ask a, what might be a controversial question for a man who has uh, a picture of <laughs> fire <laughs> fire in, in his office. So um, at what point have we humans jacked with the environment so much that longleaf pine is too hard to, to sustainably grow? At what point do you, do you, I'm going to say this and this might hurt, at what point do you give up on the longleaf pine and say we're moving on to other species? I don't. We oh. can't give up. Why? We can't lose the species. Okay, obviously. It's too unique, yeah. So you, you, you can never give up. You've got to keep trying. But this particular species has traits that we need. It's drought resistant. Yes, it is. And, and it, it's able to grow in environments that others aren't. And it provides a good product for landowners. Um, so are you trying to bridge the gap? Are you getting longleaf pine to a potential time when, you know, droughts might be an issue? Or? It could be. And that's what I think, you know, we, to me, we can never afford to lose a species because you don't know down the road where that could come into play. Got it. Have you have you noticed the the area of the longleaf pine inside this? Have you noticed that it's retracting or growing or moving? Um, now, well, most of what's happened is we cut the forest, and so you know people are cutting it for economic reasons. Um, so now they're starting to plant it back because they realize what it once meant to the southeast, and then also from an economics as well as ecological perspective. So um, until people start planting it outside its range, you know we won't know what, what happens it's going to do. Yeah. Got it. Um, you get above this line, there's a tendency to have historically more ice storms. And so what happens with Longley, because of their heavy needles and the bigger branches, ice accumulates on them in an event, and then they break off. Okay. And so that would have limited its range, whereas Loblolly and Shoreleaf Pine that would have been up there. They have much smaller needles. They're able to sort of shed the ice a little bit better than Longleaf did. And so speculation is that that line sort of represents the northern extreme for ice storms. So it's a balance between heat, uh, cold, uh, the, the acidity or the... The, the, the per- age of the soil. The age of the soil, the per- aeration of the soil. The what of the soil? Aeration. Aeration of yeah. the soil. So each tree species has its own little thing that it likes. It's the, the silvics of the species or the ecology of the species. That's it. Silvics. That's the word you taught me. Silvics. Yeah. Silvics. So... That the silvics of a tree species determine exactly why one species of tree likes to live in a certain area. And that's a function of all these things we're talking about. And whatever else nature throws at it. Really? Thank you. This is helpful. <laughs> I appreciate that. I work for the Alabama Cooperative Extension. So, yes, most of my job is helping landowners decide what trees are best them to plant. Just one second. Oh, no. No, they're washing, <laughs> they're washing the windows. Somebody literally is spraying. How often does that happen? This is the first time <laughs> this building was built. Somebody's spraying your window. I was told I have to eat within the top five dirtiest windows uh-huh. in the building. And so somebody's trying to get a contract with the university. And so they figured they'll go to the five dirtiest. They're, what the? I'll give it their best shot at it. Look at that. Literally, so you are three floors up and the floors are what? 12? The floors? first time your window has ever been washed is when I turn this camera on and you're you should off. should have come a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I should have come I've my window clean and here it is. That's incredible. <laughs> I like it. This is real. You can't fake this. No. no. I've, I've never <laughs> seen a brush like that in my life. Now you know how windows are washed.
<laughs> now I know. Yeah, I should do a whole. The bonus. This is. So this guy is stabbing. He's on the ground doing this. He's not on a ladder. He's he's a good. Look at that. Look how far away he is. Oh yeah, he's got to be a good almost forty feet. That's amazing. This is actually something I got from somebody about ten minutes ago as a gift. It is to be used for creating fire lines as well as chopping vegetation to knock it down to help spread fire a little bit better. Really? A lot of times it's great for getting rid of water oak and sweet gum. You just want to beat those suckers to death. <laughs> so are you an advocate for cutting down trees? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I guess is now's the time I should tell you that I'm trying to make a thing about helping people plant more trees. Well, I'm all for planting trees, but I'm for planting trees, the right tree in the right location. What's the best way to plant trees? Let's say, oh, I don't know, you and some of your friends are going to get together and try to plant 20 million trees in the world. Let's say you were going to do that. Oof. How would you do that? Uh, you have to come up with the sorts of trees and then find a cool wet time of the year and just start going at it. Really? Yeah. Okay, so the sorts of trees are, are important. Yes, and it really depends on planting the right tree on the right side, which Dr. Coach just been talking about. You know, that's the big thing. And that's one of the things I try to tell landowners when I work with them and talk with them, is that you need to pick the right tree to go on your piece of property. You might and love longleaf pine. Dr. Coach loves longleaf pine, and I do too. But it's, I tell people it's not the right tree for everybody. It's not the right tree for every site. Um, if you're not going to be able to use fire, then you don't need to be planting longleaf. It's just, it's as simple as that. So that's one of the things we really talk about is picking the right tree for the right location. Okay, so how does a person find the right tree for the right location? Let's say, let's say someone lives in Ohio, for example, or they live in, I don't know, uh, Wyoming, and they need to figure out the exact tree they need to plant on their property. So the first thing they need to do is, like Dr. Kush was saying, you need to think about the soils. You need to um, think about what soils you have. You need to think about what you are willing to do from a management standpoint. How active are you willing to be in the management of your property? Some people are just like, want to plant it and walk away and not have to do anything to it. And that's okay too. And there are certain things you can do from that standpoint. But most of the time you're going to have to plant it. Then you're going to have to monitor it. And you're going to have to maybe do some thinnings in there to make sure that the trees have enough water light nutrients to grow because they start to get too crowded and then they're going to start to die naturally and so you want to thin it so you don't have that natural mortality you can actually capture that mortality so there's science to it yeah a lot and you also need to know about the trees so you need to think about the tree that you want to plant and think about its life history so where does it normally occur where does it naturally occur how does it grow how tall does it get does it need a lot of sunlight or can it tolerate shade you need to think about all of those things um, what other species does it normally uh, grow with? Is it a bottomland species? Is it an upland species? Does it need water? Does it not need a lot of water? You know, so it's those things like that that you need to understand about the trees that you're wanting to plant and then making sure you, again, that's how you match the tree to your site. What, why is it, what makes planting a tree difficult? Well, for long leaf, it's its root system because it has this grass stage where it spends anywhere from two to six or seven years just looking like a tuft of grass before it puts on a woody stem where it comes out of that grass stage. Whereas all your other trees, when they germinate, they're immediately putting up a woody stem. So it has that grass stage because it was seeing fire so frequently, so it needed to keep itself protected. Insulated. Insulated, yep. Like thermally insulated. Yep. Really? Yep. Okay. So, so it has all these adaptations <laughs> saying fire was frequent. So in the case up there, if, you know, if they planted it right, if it was planted to an old field, the competition may have overrun it. Or they didn't use fire and the competition just did it in. So, But if you were to prepare a site up there properly, plant it and burn it, you would get longleaf pine to survive there. Really? No trouble. So when you say competition, are we talking like privet hedge? Like little bitty? Um, it could be grasses, a lot, a lot of woody stems. You know, fire's not there. It's going to fill up with vegetation. We can grow a lot of vegetation in the south very quickly. So you work for Extension? Yes. And, and, and where and do you Auburn. work? At so, Auburn. Okay. So Extension actually is across the entire United States. Every state has pretty much has an Extension arm and it's actually one of the three missions of most of the land-grant universities. So you think about you have 
research, you have teaching, and you have outreach or extension. And so that is cooperative extension. So our job is to help the general public understand about things, um, whether it be personal finance or you think about forestry and wildlife or ag, any of those types of things have an extension uh, arm. So, so, with it. so extension is like the connective tissue between universities and the public. We take the science that comes out of the universities and we extend it in layman's terms, more or less, to the general public. So let's say a person has land yeah. and they go to the local extension right. officer, I guess. Yeah. What, what what do you want them to know about their land? So if somebody comes in and they, what, they ask me what to do with their property, they need to know what their property is capable of. So they need to do their research on what are the soils, where are their boundary lines. And then they also need to have good conversations with their family members or other people interested in that property as far as what their goals and objectives are so that then they can make a really good plan and that plan can change. It doesn't have to be you know, static, but do they have a plan so that they can move forward with planting or managing for wildlife or pine straw or whatever it is they want to do. It's, okay, it's, something just snapped into focus. So my grandfather back in the day, I, I've heard of people and he did this, he put soil in a bag and he sent it oh, to yeah. Auburn University. Yes. What's that all about? So we have a soil lab, and most of the ag colleges have some sort of soil testing facility. So yes, you can go out there, and we actually have boxes now rather than bags, where you can actually take a little soil test kit. You go across your property, collect some soil samples, put it in a bucket, mix it up, put it in a box, send it into Auburn, and they'll test it to see what would grow best there and look at the nutrient levels. So I can literally get a box, put dirt in the box, mail it to you guys, and you'll t give me a list of what trees will mail grow? It, mail it to the soils lab, yes. Really? Yep. Okay. Do most universities do this? Yes. Okay. Not all of them, but most of them do. Is that a function of the extension? Um, yes. It's usually the ag, uh, agricultural side of it, yes. Okay. I recently bought a small piece of land that was uh, cut recently, and so it's called Slash right now. Right. It's been just destroyed. Right. It looks just awful. Just over, yeah. And I haven't done anything with it. And I know that I'm supposed to do something, but I don't know what I need to do. So right. what, you, tell me, what do I need to do? So you need to figure out what your soils are. You need to get that box and get figure out what your soil types are or look at a soil survey. And then you need to think about where it is located in the state, or, you know, and what its you know, physiographic region is. And then you need to think about what are your objectives? Are you really? I want to grow trees. That's my job. You want to grow trees. Do you have a lot of time to deal with those trees? I do not. Right. So then you need to think about growing a species that's going to not take a lot of your time and management. You want something that you can plant in the ground that's well suited to the site, that's going to grow really well on its own with you just going out there and checking on it from time to time. But sometimes you can plant things that make for their more more work. So how, how do I how do I figure this out? How do I so I, I get soil, I send it to Auburn, I get it tested, and then you send me a report back and tells me what I need to do. Right, and what, what the soil types are. Then you go back to the silvics of the trees, you look at different tree species, you look at what might grow well out there, and look at what might be you know, something that's going to go to your objective. So sometimes people just want to grow trees for short rotation, for pulpwood, for 15 years, cut them, plant them, start over. That's what they want to do. So then wildlife pine would be a good answer. Um, or if they want to plant something that they're not going to have to do a lot of work with, they're not going to have to burn it, you know, they're not going to want to have to, to do things like that, then they're going to, longleaf pine would not be a, you know, a species for somebody who doesn't want to be able to use or can't use prescribed fire. So you've taught me the worst thing I can do is nothing. The worst thing you do is nothing. And I have to do the right thing. And the way I do the right thing is I research my soil and then I make decisions about what I want to do with my land, and then I figure out the native species based on the silvics of the, trees. of the trees. And once I get the silvics for my soil and my climate and what type of topography I have. Objectives for your family. And my objectives for my family, then I can plant sustainable trees. Yes. And you will have something that is very sustainable. And also you can get help. You're not out there on your own with this. And that's another thing a lot of times people don't realize that they can get help. So you can get help with Alabama Cooperative Extension or other extension offices. Most states have 
you know, county extension offices where you can go and you can talk to people who have expertise in land management. Um, you can also talk to uh, state forestry commissions or state forestry services. They have professionals that can help you. And then there's also something called a consulting forester. So these are people who have been to school to learn how to manage for forests and they are there to represent you, the landowner. That's the biggest thing, is a registered forester or somebody with extension or somebody with a uh, forestry service, they represent you, the landowner. And they're representing your interests in there to help you make good decisions. Smart, so I need to find a forester. You do. Okay, <laughs> that's awesome. Do you see oftentimes people just want to plant trees just yes. to do good? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, for sure. They just And so that's what they just want to plant trees and they're like, oh, I want to have these trees out here. And I've actually had a landowner I talked to, they had somebody recommend some to plant longleaf and because they just wanted to have trees out there. But they, unfortunately, the landowner didn't understand about the silvics of longleaf. And so they didn't understand that they needed to be burned. They didn't understand how they needed to be managed. And so then they were kind of surprised by the fact that they needed to burn them or how they, or how they were growing very slowly, you know, because they keep staying in that grass stage very long. So it's not enough to say this tree does good in this environment. You have to also understand what upkeep is required for yes, that type of tree. very much so. Or in the event that you don't want to spend the time to do the upkeep, just get, just nail the silvix. Yes. Pick one that's going to work for you. Awesome. That's the key. This is huge. You give me a box? Mm-hmm. I'm going to get a soil box. Yes. Soil box. I can't say the word soil. <laughs> okay, so is this my soil box? This is your soil box. Okay. So there, what you'll do is you'll take, you can just take a shovel and just go around different spots on your property and put them in a big bucket uh -huh. and dump it in there, mix it up, and then take some of it and put it in this box. Uh -huh. And you send it, you'll send it to Auburn, but you can send it to me and we'll turn it in. Get it done? That's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so you've got longleaf pine here that's in the grass stage. So I planted this four years ago, um, the idea of trying to bring longleaf pine back to this site. And so it has this stage where it doesn't really put on any woody extension growth like all trees do. Um, and so it waits for its chance to take fires for a couple years and then out of that central bud it will one day decide that it's time to come out of the grass stage and off it will go. Really? That is, what not, that, that is not what I think of when I think of a, a, a small tree. It is not. And see, so any tree, any longleaf pine, this size can take fire. Any other tree will die. So that's why it exists like that's this. That's why it exists like this. It has that grass stage to keep it there so it can take fire every couple of years. And then when it comes out of that grass stage, it'll put on four or five feet of growth in that year, get its quote unquote head above the fire and it just hangs out for the next three, 400 years. So this is just a completely different strategy for survival. Absolutely. Unique in the world. There's not another tree that does that? That has this kind of a, a stage. There's something maybe in Mexico, something in Australia, it's sort of pseudo like it, but nothing that has this grass stage where it needs fire in order to keep itself there. So why do you, uh, forgive, forgive this question please, but why do you like it so much? Like this, it's clearly difficult to grow in terms of like, the economics of growing uh, sustainable resources in wood. So why why should we pay attention to this? Because it's the only tree that can take fire on a pretty much yearly basis and be there, which then supported all the wildlife species that we had and the plant species. So it becomes one of, it's the whole big picture for the ecosystem. This is such a unique species. Whatever climate does, the key is fire for longleaf pine. Got it. If it doesn't have fire, doesn't matter where it's at. As an ecosystem, it won't make it. Got it. Yeah, so right now is a good example. You know, it hasn't rained in Auburn for 35 days. You've got that seedling that's alive. That lavalite pine seedling is dead. That one right there? That is not coming back. Can you go show me why? Oh, this is a loblolly pine. This is a loblolly pine. So this is So this is a loblolly pine. And that's longer. So this is because this is only two years old and that's four years old. So it's staying in that grass stage because it says, I'm not ready to come out yet. Things are not in shape. This tree, it germinates and said, I'm off to the races. Let's go. Because we're, we're in 35 days of drought. Did this die recently? Yeah, this is probably just died within the last three or four days. Oh, really? Yeah. So we've got some real data here. This is real data. So this is actual. Loblolly pine died yep. because of the drought. 
Loblight pine died over there because of itself, but the long leaf pine. The long leaf pine is just kicking it. It's just kicking it. It's just hanging out saying, I'm not quite ready to come out of the grass stage. What that trigger is going to be, nobody knows, but at some point it's going to figure point, it out. My guess is based on the size now, it's going to come out next year. Really? If we were to come back next year at this time, I'm guessing it'll be about this tall. How tall? It'll grow, it'll just. It'll put on four or five feet once it decides to come out of the grass stage. So, so the the loblolly pine is not drought resistant. Nope. The long leaf pine here chills out like that. That's four years old, and then just massively it'll sprout up. Yeah. That's a really interesting strategy. So cool. So does it take a tremendous amount of, of like energy to do that? Like that's why it has an extensive root system. Oh. So. At some point, it just captures all those Whatever, nutrients. Yeah, what that triggers, nobody knows. Um, you know, trees above ground will put on an annual growth ring. And so you, you know how old it is. But longleaf pine, the roots seem to be growing year round. It does not put on an annual ring of growth. So, On the tree, it doesn't? Not when it's in the grass stage. Got it. So it's different when it gets above, when that wood gets above the ground, then it'll have a growth ring where you can then age it. But in the grass stage. That's awesome. It, okay. All bets are off. That's awesome. So are you studying the longleaf pine for drought resistance? Um, I don't think you really need to. I mean, because it's just naturally adapted to drought. Is that why you care about it so much? Uh, no, I care about it because of the ecosystem perspective. Okay. Um, it being the, it was the native species for most of the Southeast and because of fire, um, you know, 75% of our threatened and endangered species are associated with the longleaf pine ecosystem. What do you mean? Uh, that's where you found them and that's where they're suffering because we're losing that ecosystem much of it's becoming, it's getting filled in with other hardwoods because of the lack of fire. So it's not about just saving a tree. It's not about saving a tree. It's about the, all the big picture. Yep, saving the plants and the animals and the insects and the reptiles and amphibians. And really? That's what nature put there. So I'm a firm believer that nature knows how to manage nature best. So if you're we, trying to get out of the way. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Yeah. So these are longleaf pine plugs. So they were grown in a nursery in little tubes. Um, they grow them for usually about a year. They get pulled and then when it's planting season, which usually goes somewhere from beginning of December until March, done at the cooler time of the year when the ground moisture should be a little bit higher. Um, these are what get planted today for the most part for longleaf pine. For most other species, a lot of times they're just bare roots where they weren't, they were just growing out in a field and they cut the roots and then just pull them out. And so you've got roots all over the place. But for longleaf, because it's been difficult getting bare root seedlings to survive with planting, probably because it has to happen so quickly, they came up with a way that increases chances of survival. So how it should work is you step down, it pulls out a plug. And then you put it in. Put it in there, tap it in with your shoe onto the next tree. But we're not going to do this today, right? We can't do this today, at least right here, because the ground is so dry and therefore so hard that our planting tool will not get into the soil. Got it. So in general, a lot of people want to plant trees. Like yes. everybody wants to plant trees, but you can do it wrong, right? Oh, yeah. OK, so just Very going much so. and planting a, a thousand trees, if you screw it up, you're just going to waste a thousand trees. Yes. So the key is not just to plant trees to make yourself feel good. The key is to do it in a smart, intelligent, respectful way for the environment, right? Absolutely. Okay, and what is that way? You're saying today you showed me with the plug, does it make sense today because of how dry it is? Right. So where do you go find that information and then how do you make decisions about how to plant trees? The biggest thing is keeping information for yourself, is knowing what the weather has been. Um, so I think the smartest person is you who are out there you know, figuring out what your land is and where you want to do something. Once you know the silvics of the tree and you know your local environment, you make the decision about when to plant the trees. Yeah. Smart. That's awesome. Thanks for teaching me all this. I really appreciate it. Enjoy thank it. You. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. You guys are great. And thanks for holding the microphone. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so I'm driving down this highway in North Florida, right? It's totally gonna look like I planned this, but I did not. I see on my left these tall pine trees that are scorched on the bottom. I'm like, oh, that's fire, like they were telling me at Auburn. It looks very clean over here. I look at the other side of the road, the bottom of the forest floor is just matted and mangled, and then I see a sign that says longleaf. 
I'm like, somebody here knows about the longleaf pine and knows that it's important to burn. And so I got out of my truck. Look at this. I could not have planned this. The E.O. Wilson Biophilia Center. These people are all about the entire ecosystem created when a longleaf pine does what the longleaf pine is supposed to do. This is amazing. They were fantastic. I want to show you what I learned. Let's go check this out. Hey, how's it going? Okay, so I just walked into the E.O. Wilson Biophilia Center, right? Yes. This is Ashland. <laughs> I just found this place, and I'm seeing that right there, which leads me to believe that you guys believe in burning oh, yes. to promote longleaf pine health. Is that right? Yes. Very okay. controlled burning. Controlled burning, <laughs> but the whole idea is to get the fuel at the, at the bottom of the ecosystem to you know, just take out all the, the scrub brush, right? Exactly, yes. Cool, and you said there's somebody I could talk to? Yeah, definitely, we'll find Bob. All right, so this is our burn master here. Are you the burn master? He is. We sometimes saw him burning Bob. <laughs> hey, I'm Destin. Hi, Agnes. Nice to meet you. So you know about burning longleaf pines? Well, we burned a few. <laughs> <laughs> Planted a few as well. So you bring kids in and you educate them on... All fourth and seventh graders from the local five counties. Really? They see us for either two or four days. We teach them all about longleaf, all about the animals that live here, why it's important, all that good stuff. That's awesome. <laughs> so you teach them about the longleaf pine ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we go through it pretty closely. Oh, that's awesome. In fact, tomorrow we're having a fire presentation. Really? And yep. we talk about how important fire is. Oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> you found the right yeah. place. Yeah, I did find the right place. That's cool. This is serendipity. I had no idea you existed, and yeah. now yeah. I just drove by. You're Fire Bob, right? Burning Bob. Burning, Burning Bob. Bob. <laughs> Whenever we need him to be fire. <laughs> so, Burning Bob, what is the importance of the longleaf pine for the ecosystem overall? Like, why is fire important to keep it alive? And then, what does the longleaf pine do to the ecosystem as a whole? Fire is important to keep the longleaf pine ecosystem alive because, to start with, it requires bare mineral soil to start germinating. Okay. And that gets the, that gets the longleaf pine to get started. And then it slowly grows and puts a heavy duty tap root into the ground. And it's really important because when we have fire, the other trees will be killed. Right? But the longleaf pine survives. But why is that a good thing? Like why, why is the longleaf pine more important than other trees? The longleaf pine is the longest living tree that lives in this area. They could live up to four to five hundred years. Most all the other pine trees up to a hundred years, and that is about it. Oh, okay. So if you can establish a longleaf pine, then you're going to have a, an old growth forest. Eventually. Exactly. Eventually, yes. Yes. Yeah. It, and this area, they have adapted to fire. We are in a fire forest. The longleaf pine ecosystem is also called the fire forest. We have to have that fire. Not just for that little pine that pop up, but also because it creates fertilizer for the other plants, but it also opens it up so there's not a heavy canopy on the ground. It kills off a lot of the invasive oak trees or other plants like Ilex vomitoria. And then what it does is it opens it up enough for gopher tortoises to survive. Gopher tortoises have to have an open habitat. Really? Is that is that what's behind you? Uh, what we have a couple oh, back there. I can show you some good tortoises. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. Yeah. In awesome. fact, you will be going by a tortoise enclosure where we have tortoises in there. Yeah. We may not see the tortoise, but you'll see the burrows. That's awesome. Yeah. So so if I understand correctly, again, again, I just drove up on Bob here, and we don't even know each other yet. But you're saying that because of the longleaf pine you can have a whole variety of different animals. So a forest or a planting a tree isn't about the tree, it's about the entire ecosystem. It's about the entire system, yes. The Longley Pine ecosystem one is one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the country. It entailed at one time close to 90 million acres, and now it is down to pretty close to 2 million acres. So are you trying to rejuvenate the Longleaf Pine population? So we're trying to bring it back. And this area that we have, the Negosi Plantation is the name of the land. It's 55,000 acres. Gotcha. And it is a restoration project where we're trying to bring it back into the old Longleaf Pine ecosystem it once was. So if I have an option on like small land plots or something like yes. that to plant a tree, yes. you would say I should plant Longleaf Pine? I would say that would be the most appropriate <laughs> tree to plant if you're in an upland area. 
you know, deep sandy soils. If you're in a wetland area, hydro community, then you don't want long leaf pines, you want something else. There's a couple right here. Oh, they're huge. There you go. Those are, those were grown here? These are, yes. These are long leaf pine cones from the Gozi Plantation. Wow. How old would a tree have to be before it could make something like this? It could be probably 15 years old. Really? They can start growing, they, to, they can start being mature at close to 15 years. So I've heard something about like, there's some types of pine cones that are activated by fire. Yeah, this is not one of them. Oh, okay. This one, what it requires is it requires that fire to go through and create a bare mineral soil and then the seeds drop off onto that bare sand and then they will germinate. If there hasn't been fire, that ground cover will start growing and then these seeds will drop and they won't grow. That's amazing. They have to have that bare sand, yes. Uh -huh. so, so the underbrush, it kills stuff. Or it, it just it doesn't get it to the dirt. It reduces it more than anything, yes. Awesome. Thank you very much, Bob. Well, sure. This is sure. great. I, I, sure. I know this was spontaneous. How many have we planted? One million? We planted, I, the last thing I've heard, we planted about 8 million longleaf pines on our... Here? Negosi Plantation. Really? Negosi is a Native American term that means black bear. It's spelled N-O-K-U-S-E. And the owner, the person who purchased the land, at one time didn't know there were black bears in Florida. And then he became interested and purchased the 55,000 acres and named it after that black bear because eventually we are hoping that, that the black bear will return on our property. Wow. In good numbers mm -hmm. like they were at one time. So the whole plan with the trees is to eventually get to the, the natural ecosystem that used to exist here. Exactly. And it takes a long time and, and Mr. Davis, MC Davis, who purchased the land, decided that it was going to be close to a 300-year project to actually have that restoration be a complete success. Which is why you're going with longleaf pine, because it'll last 400 because years. this is the native tree that was here to start with. That's why we want the tree back. It's still one of the natives. This is amazing. <laughs> I had no idea. I just thought like, oh, longleaf pine, that's a type of pine tree. Yeah, yep. yeah. That's what most people think. And it is. It is a type of pine tree. But it's the, but it's it's the pine tree. <laughs> it's the pine tree we want. Yes, yeah. exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Are these examples of animals that exist in the ecosystem? Oh, jeez. You can yes be here no. for the next three hours. Every, uh, yeah. How about I just get a, a, a little bit of... This is Bob's favorite thing in the world. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so this one that he's going to talk about is a very important one that okay. specifically is in this ecosystem and is having a hard time because of the lack of ecosystem available today. Really? So so this is an animal... Oh, I see it. Is this a black racer? This is a, a reptile it that, is, that, that um, is native to the southeast in the coastal plain longleaf pine ecosystem. And here she is. This is an indigo snake. Indigo snake. She's beautiful. They, they are the longest snake in North, non venomous snake in North America, attaining a length of eight and a half feet. Really? And they exist in this ecosystem? And they are in this ecosystem because of the gopher tortoise. I don't understand. The gopher tortoise is called a keystone species. When that gopher tortoise digs a burrow in the ground, they have a lot of space in that burrow. And that burrow is created uh, to keep for that tortoise to keep away from fire, to keep away from predators, to hibernate in the winter time. So a keystone species is an animal that helps other animals. And when that gopher tortoise builds that burrow, there's a lot of animals. There's over 360 different types of animals that live in this burrow. And some of them require the burrow. The indigo snake is one that requires that burrow. And so because they, they're so big, they are slow to get away from predators. They're slow to get away from fire. So they need that burrow to get into, to keep away from fire and predators. And wow. Hibernate. So the tree makes the, the, the tortoise, and the tortoise makes the burrow, and the burrow makes the other species. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. That sounds good. Yeah. That's amazing. And this snake here no longer lives in this area. It's been extirpated from this area, and extirpated basically means extinct from this little area 
due to the loss of our gopher tortoise burrows. Gotcha. And so it, it's no longer here. They are in other parts of Florida. They're in, the, in Alabama some, uh, in Georgia, but they need that burrow. They really, it's very important to them. That's amazing. Thanks for showing me this, Bob. Sure. This, the patterns of the scales are so neat. There's one. They are. Exactly. One really odd, odd scale there. Yeah. That's neat. Hey, thanks, Bob. Oh, sure. Thank you very much, man. You're this welcome. is great. Hey, Bob. Yeah, we'll see you later. You can... I figured you were the one to. Is that a to. bobcat? It is. What are you doing, bobcat? Hiding up in so the these are. Room. Wow. That's Zeta. She's a southern bobcat. I have never seen a bobcat this close. <laughs> I. I can't believe I found you guys. I'm gonna to have to come back and do a proper visit. Yeah. So this is a gopher tortoise. And these are the the turtles, or they're not turtles, they're tortoises that make the burrows, right? Yes. And they make, they make the burrows as a, as a result of the longleaf pine? So they do make it in that nice open sandy soil that can be found in the longleaf pine ecosystem. And they dig those burrows really far into the ground. And it's not only important for them, uh, but they are a keystone species because they're going to dig those burrows, which can house up to 200 or 350 other species, um, especially during those fires. So <laughs> She's waving. Those animals need places to go. A really good place to do that is going to be a big hole in the ground. Oh, that's awesome. Is it cool if I hop on with you? Yeah, definitely. All right, so Ashlyn is going to show me the different um, stages of longleaf pine growth. I've seen the grass stage. Yes, so, so they that's our grass stage. They showed me that at Auburn. So, so that is our first stage. What's after that? Then we have our bottle brush. Kind of looks like it's made for cleaning a really big baby bottle. Wow, okay. How old is that? Um, probably about five or six, maybe. And then our third stage are saplings. They've started to get their branches, so they're officially out of that bottle brush stage. So how old would these guys be? These ones are probably a little closer to nine, maybe 10. We've got some older ones up ahead as well. And then a couple of the adult stages. So those are the older ones right there. Yeah, we got some older ones up ahead. And then these big trees are all gonna be our adults. Now we do have every stage on our land except old growth. Old growth is gonna be after 80 years old. That's when they officially reach their old growth stage. So that's the goal. Yes. On all of our 55,000 acres, we don't have a single old growth tree that I'm aware of. Um, they know that it's old growth because it actually gets squishy in the middle. It gets what's known as red heart disease, um, which doesn't kill the tree, but it just makes it squishy enough uh, for a particular kind of woodpecker known as a red cockaded woodpecker to actually make its cavity and uh, live in the tree. Really? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So do you know of any old growth longleaf pines in existence? Yes. Um, so about 2% of that original ecosystem exists, so those would be old growth. Um, we actually have Eglin Air Force Base that's right across from us, across the main highway. They have old growth trees, they have red cockaded woodpeckers and burrowing owls and gopher tortoises, and they protect all of them. So they actually have their old growth trees marked. You can't go within 20 feet of them. Really? Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. So that would be a gopher tortoise burrow. Really? So you can always tell it's a gopher tortoise burrow based on the shape. Always going to be in a perfect half moon uh, entrance, just big enough for the tortoise to slide in and out of. So this would be an adult. You can see it's pretty big. Um, so that would be our adult burrow. Just to be clear, the goal in life is to have a job as cool as Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> you get to wander around outside all day. You get to educate people about science. Oh, yeah. You get to do some cool stuff. This right here explains everything in one shot. So what am I looking at here? All right, so this side has been burned most recently. Uh, it, it's due for a little bit of a burn, but if you look at it, you can see overall that it is gonna be a little bit more wide open of a space. It'd be very easy for a hawk to maybe fly through there. Um, we've got a lot of wire grass on the ground, which means that it has been opened up thanks to that fire. Uh, they've bloomed after their nice burn in the winter and so they have spread their seed and they're taking over that bottom floor. We do also have a couple long leaves that you can see have reached their sapling stage which means they have been burned properly. Uh, they're growing at a good rate. We will occasionally also see our nice wildflowers growing in there, that nice rich soil that we're looking for. So this is like what the natural forest looks like. Yes, if we didn't burn it, uh, lightning would and then it would eventually have this nice open clear area lots of room for the wildlife 
to live in compared but this side. to this side. <laughs> not so much going on here. Uh, we've got a lot of trees growing, lots of different kinds of trees. We've got some slash pines. We've got some oak trees, yopon hollies uh, taking over, uh, kind of crowding out some of those other pine trees that would typically be here. Not as much wire grass that hasn't been burned, so it hasn't spread. And then there's a ton of leaf litter on the ground. So we actually call that pine straw our fuel load. If lightning were to strike that right now, it would burn entirely too hot, entirely too quick, and would definitely turn into a wildfire, which would be very bad. So if you had a fire in here, mm -hmm. what would happen? Like right now, because it's open. I Perfect mean, conditioning. Um, as long as we had the wind in the proper direction, not too humid, not too dry, we would cut off these fire lines. You can see these trails. We would actually dig that up because sand doesn't burn. So we would actually make a nice little perimeter around our burn plot. And then we would actually do a very low and slow burn against the wind so that it would kind of keep it from getting out of control. And we would just let it kind of do its thing. It would take a little bit to get its way through. And then you'd have all of these nice pine trees still there. A lot of these little oak trees would be gone. Wire grass would burn up and you'd see it growing back the next day. So if you think about it, if the forest was natural and it was, you know, a place where fire happened often because of lightning, what, what would a fire today look like here? Far more controlled, uh, going to move nice and slow across the ecosystem, get rid of some of these little extra bushes, but all of those pine trees would be staying strong. Opposed to this. <laughs> this would probably ignite and immediately turn into a wildfire, burning up all of these trees and probably also damaging some of those pine trees as well. So this is bad for humans because our houses would get burned up because of stuff like this. Exactly. So if we do small controlled burns, we can basically control what the forest looks like and we can control the wildfires. Exactly. So it's in moderation. Yes. That's Which we do small burns. Um, Eglin does giant burns. They burn with helicopters. Do they really? <laughs> we burn with little torches. <laughs> wow. So this scorching that you see is from the fires. Yes. Some of them may have burned a little hot, so you can see that it did cause a little bit of damage, but it has not killed the tree. The tree is still surviving and still growing. So it will stay charred for a little bit, but there's actually some creatures in this area that will take that charcoal off the tree and actually use it. So what do they do with charcoal? Um, there's a particular kind of ant known as the harvester ant, uh, native in this area, much better than fire ants. And they actually will take it and they put it around their nest and they don't actually know for sure why. They think the best reasoning is that it actually absorbs more heat from the sun and it keeps their nest warm during the winter. Really? That's interesting. I can't tell you how awesome this was. This yeah. was great. Thank you. <laughs> this is good. Sweet. So, uh, so my grandfather, I'm from North Alabama and 60 years ago, my grandfather tried to grow longleaf pines mm -hmm. and they all died. Yeah. Yeah, and so I'm thinking about redoing that because we're right on the edge of where longleaf pines will grow. Yeah, definitely. But I didn't know it was because they'll live 300 years old. They live a long time. And the bright side, especially in this area, you don't typically have to worry about them during hurricanes because that nice tap root keeps them in the ground. They don't tip over. Really? They're more likely to snap from heavy wind, they'll snap in half, rather than being completely tipped up from the ground. If they snap in half, do they die? I think they will grow back, actually. Really? They, they, their root system would still be maintained. So it's a more sustainable tree? It is. They're pretty hardy. But they're not grown for paper and things like that? Um, they can be used for lumber um, and for starter wood. Starter wood a lot of times is longleaf. Um, it actually is a very good lumber because of how strong the wood is. It grows so slow that it actually traps sap in the rings of the tree and then it never goes away. You can actually find preserved pieces of longleaf from old uh, houses from hundreds of years ago. Um, we actually have a out on our property we found a really old grave site where the headstones are made from longleaf and you can't read them anymore but they are still there you can see that they are headstones headstones made from wood yep really that have lasted this long because it never goes away they actually used to have laws that said if you were building a boat you had to use longleaf for your mast 
because it was the only thing that was going to survive. It was the only thing that was going to snap or break or deteriorate from the weather. No way. Yep. Are those obviously those laws aren't still in the books because we have steel now. Yes. But oh, that's interesting. Well, that's part of why we don't have it around anymore. Is everybody knew it was good lumber, so they cut it down and then realized uh, nobody had time for it to grow back. So that law actually led to the <laughs> decline. I'm sure it did not help. <laughs> if I had to guess. So Ashlyn, what is your favorite part about your job? I love seeing kids learn about what's in their own backyard. They never realize how cool this ecosystem is. Half the time they're afraid of snakes. Turtle Bob changes that <laughs> almost immediately. And seeing them actually learn and be excited about the area and want to actually become naturalist and protect it. That's awesome. Back. That's cool. So if I were to decide to plant a tree, yes. what would you tell me? What do I need to know? I would say plant a long leaf. If you live in an area that'll sustain a long leaf, you're gonna need to be upland, not too wet. Um, definitely stick to the native plants. Stick with the native things. So look at the local environment and uh, the ecosystem and, and identify the silvics of the trees in your area and figure out what trees will grow there and then pick something like that, you'd say? Yeah, something that a lot of different animals are gonna use. Okay, so think about the whole ecosystem. Don't just think about the one tree. Yeah, it doesn't have to look pretty. But it has a job. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that woodpecker like the goal to get the? Um, he is the federally endangered one. He has to have the trees that are at least 80 years old when they get soft in the middle. They make their home in living longleaf pines. Um, and before 80 years old, you don't want to slam your face into a longleaf pine. They're hard. <laughs> um, but after that 80 years, when they get that squishiness to them, they can actually drill their cavities, and you can see that the sap will run down the tree which actually protects them from things like snakes that would typically be found climbing up the trees to eat them. Um, so they are federally protected, they are federally endangered, and that's mostly because they don't have enough trees. They don't have those longleaf pines to make their homes in. Um, but hopefully we'll get some of those old growths back and they'll come back into the area. That's awesome. They're always the half moon shape like that. Oh, because a turtle shell's half moon. Exactly. <laughs> If it's took, round, it's probably an armadillo. If it's half moon, it's going to be go for tortoise. Took me a second. <laughs> <laughs> this is our cross section of our longleaf pine. And we actually have a timeline uh, along with it. So we have our different years. And you can see that this tree was starting off in 1681. Um, and you can see we have it all the way up until we've marked until 71. And there's still a couple years left in there. So you can see. Those lines are so tight together because not a lot of growth going on. Um, but you can actually look at them sometimes and see burning years versus non-burning years. They grow a little faster during the burning years. Um, areas where maybe it was drier versus wetter based on those rings as well. Really? Yeah. So, so longleaf pine wood is much tighter and more dense than normal yes, pine. extremely dense. So you can see that these ones are really close together and then you'll see that they will start to get a little more wide. Um, so those are probably going to represent years where it was burned. So that right there is definitely a burn year. Yeah, with that wide gap there. And, and that's because they grow during seasons of fire. Yes, they will actually grow better after that fire. More nutrients for the trees. That's fascinating. Yeah. Is this the longleaf pine? Yes, so that's gonna show the so original I've... range. And then this is going to show the current remaining. So this would be our plantation. We've actually added to that. And the whole point is that eventually, you can see that we actually touch Eglin Air Force Base, which has that original longleaf ecosystem on it. So there's a lot of animals that live here that we actually have a bridge that goes underneath the uh, highway, it's an eco passage, so that these animals can go from this land and make their way onto ours and start inhabiting it as the habitat gets to where it needs to be. Oh, that's awesome. So um, how many trees would you say you've planted over the years? Um, they have planted about 8 million pine trees. Really? Our land. And it was just clear cut before that, or? Um, it was a lot of old farmland where they had just used the soil to the point where it wouldn't grow crops, but it's perfect soil for longleaf. They dig it. Yep, totally fine with that. <laughs> That's awesome. Sweet. So this is why you have the tortoise right here in, in the, the beginning of the, the whole museum here. That's Shelly the goat tortoise. Shelly, 
um, is here because of the longleaf pine. That's called the keystone species. Yes. Okay, and the ultimate goal is to get the bears back. Yes. Uh, bears take up a lot of range. They have a very large home range where they search for food. Um, so they need a lot of habitat. So we want to get enough habitat for them to be able to survive. We actually have now about 15 bears that we know of for sure on our land, um, which is a good sign. That's, they're an umbrella species. Usually if they can survive, there's a lot of smaller creatures along the way that can also survive in that area. So you just taught me some words. So you say you have a keystone species yes. that is at the bottom of the ecosystem. So the keystone holds up all of the other species. And, and the bear is the umbrella. So if the bear comes yes. back, you know. So that if the bear come back, comes back, you can get a lot of other species behind it. The keystone species means that they do something that because of them, other animals survive. So keystone actually comes from the term for doorways. When they used to build doorways out of stones, that top stone would take all of the pressure. And if you didn't have that stone, the entire doorway would collapse. So that is what keeps all of the other animals uh, within the habitat. It gives them some, somewhere to go, a burrow to hide in, especially during fires. Um, and they're aerating that soil as they're digging those burrows as well. So what Ashlyn and Turtle Bob taught me today is that if you have a keystone species like this tortoise, um, that will support a lot of the, the different species in the ecosystem. And the ultimate goal is to hopefully get to the place where you can have bears return, in this case, known as an umbrella species. Umbrella species. Yeah, and all this is made possible by the open forest floor caused by the longleaf pine, yes. right? Exactly. You're smart and you're very helpful. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you so much, Ashlyn. Okay, again, uh, please consider going to teamtrees.org and donating. Our goal is simple. All of us content creators are coming together to work as one. We're unified on this one topic. Please donate at teamtrees.org or click that donation button down at the bottom of this video. We're gonna plant 20 million trees and we need your help to do it. Teamtrees.org is like the most efficient and effective way to plant trees and I would love for you to go check it out because one dollar for one tree, that's like as efficient as it gets. Please consider donating there. I would be over the moon if we hit 20 million trees by 2020. Anyway, please consider that. You can also click the donation link down below this video. I'm Destin, you're getting smarter every day. Have a good one, bye.